Welcome to It's a Woman's World, a show which discusses any and all topics under the sun from a woman's point of view. Hosted today by Dr. Susan Strauss. Hi, welcome to It's a Woman's World. I'm Dr. Susan Strauss, and I'm glad you joined us today because we've got a great program, as always. I am delighted to introduce to you Dr. Lael Baker DeCray, and Lael is with the Minneapolis Indian Health Board. Welcome, Lael, we're glad you're with us. Thank you. Now, Lael, tell us what your native name is, as well as your tribe and your clan. Sure. Uh, my Hiratsa name is Hishua Oroka Bagish, means peppermint blossoms. Okay. Um, I'm a member of the Knife Clan, and I'm from the three affiliated tribes in North Dakota. So that's the Hiratsa, Nueta, and Sanish people. Now, was that name given to you at birth, your, uh, your native name? It was. Okay. It was given to, be, given to me by one of my great-great-grandmothers. Oh, That's how good. wonderful. Uh, and do people call you by your native name very often? Back home, some of my aunties do, or they give me a short nickname version of it. Which is what? She calls me Guppy. Guppy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but, okay. Yeah. Otherwise, I'm... They just call me Leo. All right. Well, tell us what the Minneapolis Indian Health Board is all about. Sure. Um, so I'm a licensed clinical psychologist in the counseling department there, and I'm also a training director for the psychology program there. Um, Indian Health Board has been around since the early 70s. Okay. And it was originally created by uh, indigenous people in the community to help um, underserved the underserved native community. Okay. And about uh, how many clients or patients, should we say, do you see perhaps in a month? Sure. Um, so in the counseling department, I would say the average psychologist would see, or the average therapist would see uh, 20 to 30 clients a week. Oh, a week, okay. Uh, my job's a little different because part of my time is uh, running the training program. Sure, mm -hmm. I, and do you offer educational programs for your clients and patients as well? We offer several different services. So there's the traditional individual therapy, but we also provide group therapy. Um, we do psychological testing and assessment. We do cultural education, so we have elders that work with us that we can refer clients to to help them in oh, their spiritual okay. and cultural life as well. What constitutes an elder, by the way? Uh, that's, a, that's a big question. <laughs> <laughs> um, you might get different definitions from different people, but uh, an elder is someone who carries a certain level of wisdom and has okay. been part of the community for a long time that you would go to to seek um, help with in any way, or okay. they guide you along in your cultural and spiritual life ways. Okay. Now, I know that your focus is on the psychological aspects. What other services does the Indian mm -hmm. Health Board offer? We have a medical clinic and a dental clinic. Uh, we also have other programs like WIC, um, diabetes and diabetes mm. prevention programs and classes for the community. Uh, we partner with some other programs in the neighborhood around um, a medicine garden, Meshkiki Gidigan, oh. and um, that's where we grow a lot of plants and foods and get together as a community and help to harvest them. Too. Okay. Now, because we don't have a lot of time, mm -hmm. I want to focus in on your role as a psychologist there. And it's my understanding that much of the work, I'm not sure how much, but that a fair amount of the work that's done within the psych department deals with trauma mm -hmm. from sexual assault mm -hmm. and other historical types of trauma. Mm -hmm. And, and there's been some interesting reads on this lately, not just from the indigenous perspective, but in general about how we as humans can carry trauma from generations past. Mm -hmm. and, and, I, and I know that you've talked a little bit too about it being in our throats. Could you talk to us a little bit about the sure. sexual assault and how is that generational in this throat? Sure. Uh, so the training we perspective that we take in our work doesn't always come from western psychology mm -hmm. uh, it comes from indigenous psychology as well and um, we look at trauma a little bit differently like the traditional diagnosis of ptsd the symptoms that people come in with 
or what's troubling them when they come in, it doesn't really fit into that box of PTSD. Okay. It's usually bigger. It's they're carrying the trauma of the community, of the collective, um, of their ancestors, of generations past, and it's ongoing. So uh, when we talk about historical trauma, it's not something that necessarily happened in the past uh, as, an, as a consequence of um, colonization. It's ongoing. Genocide is ongoing in our communities. Uh, okay. Our land is technically still being occupied. So, and, and the system that we have to live in is still an oppressive environment. Yes. So there's all these, all of these systemic pressures that contribute to the trauma that a lot of our, our people hold. Um, and the way that we look at it is it's not just a, a physical or a psychological manifestation. There is a spiritual trauma that's taken place, too, that we carry in our bodies, carry in our DNA, something that we call blood memory. Um, and an example of that might be uh, our, our, we couldn't practice our, ceremon our ceremonies or our spiritual beliefs. It was illegal up until, I think, 1978 for us to openly practice. And really? so really? a lot of it had to go underground. And, and in addition to carrying this, this trauma, um, this collective grief is another way that people have um, described it, or, or ethno stress is another, oh, another definition, okay. is we also carry um, hundreds of years of of resilience, um, of wisdom. Uh, we still know our ceremonial life ways, even though a lot of them, it was, they were, um, the government tried to take them away from us. We're still holding on to those in our languages. Knowing our clan ways, knowing our cultural and ceremonial life ways has helped us to um, survive despite the trauma. Uh, and, and that's part of our healing that we do at Indian Health Board in addition to just the Western psychology practice. This is also bringing in the culture and spirituality. So I grew up with a lot of my spiritual and cultural life ways. And then when I went to school, it, it was a challenge to walk in both worlds, so to speak, um, because you have to learn the Western way of doing things. You have to look at things um, kind of in these boxes, too, which is very different than, than the, the, way that, the way that I grew up. I, I guess I kind of have labeled myself as a translator because mm -hmm. in, in the room, when I'm working with someone, uh, we're doing more than just working with the individual. We're working with, you know, 500 plus years of trauma that they're bringing in, um, stress and trauma that's happening with their family that they're carrying with them also. And then when it comes to the, the Western psychology piece of it, I have to translate that, you know, in order to bill for the service, to, you know, diagnose and pathologize. So it's like I have to hold both of those at the same time, and it is a challenge at times. Um, but I think, I think viewing myself as a translator for the Western world and, and um, describing things in the way that, you know, third-party payers yes, might understand yes. it, it, you know, a lot of it is lost in that, but we're still doing what's required for the service in the Western framework yeah. and still helping the, the client on a much deeper level. Our voices were taken away uh, through, through oppression, through colonization, um, through relocation, through uh, ancestors and generations past being in residential boarding schools and all the trauma that took place there, where you can't talk, you can't speak, you can't fight back. And just to clarify, the, the trauma that took place in those residential schools mm -hmm. was primarily what? A lot of abuse, physical, sexual abuse. Okay. Um, you're not allowed to speak your language. You're not allowed to wear your dress. Um, your hair was cut short. You had to assimilate. You had to be white. You had to be Christian. You had to be Catholic. Uh, so so your, your whole identity is taken away, and you can't voice, you know, that you didn't want that, otherwise you would die, or your family would die. Um, so, so in our, in returning to our cultural and spiritual life ways, which we are integrating into our work at the Indian Health Board, you're trying to bring that voice back through the singing, through the the healing songs that we sing, and through the use of the drum too, and the rattle, and other parts of our cultural and spiritual life. Which ways. we'll be talking about with the next mm -hmm. segment. And so, children 
adults that were children back then have carried that trauma they with have. them. And then if I'm understanding this, mm -hmm. their trauma also gets passed on to their children, is that correct? Yeah, that's, that's um, I guess, how we're seeing it. Uh, the traumas that have happened to our ancestors are carried on in our blood memory. In the blood memory. But not just the traumas, right? The, the positives. The, the language, yeah, the positives, the culture, the ceremony, the survival is also carried on. Okay. Um, so we don't lose sight of that. Oh, this is so interesting. Um, Lael, I'd love to sit and talk to you much more, but unfortunately, we're running out of time. So I would like to thank all of you for joining It's a Woman's World, and stay tuned for the next segment as we'll talk to some additional indigenous women and about their drumming. Thank you. Hi, welcome back to It's a Woman's World. And we've got a great group of women with us today. They are Ogichi Dakwe Council and Singing and Drumming Group. I'm so glad I pronounced that correctly. And I'm going to let them introduce themselves to you, not only with their English names, but also with their indigenous names. So I'm going to start over here. And the reason, by the way, we're doing this is that Emma, the, these three women are all elders, and Emma is the oldest of the elders, and that's the way it's done in the indigenous community. Mm -hmm. So Emma, please introduce yourself, and including your native name, your tribe, and your clan. Hi, my name is Emma Geyer, and my native name is Niwagabuik, which means four women standing. And I'm from Rainy River First Nations, Ontario, Canada, and I'm the Elk Clan, and I live at the Elders Lodge in St. Paul. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you. Okay, go ahead. My name is Eileen Hudan. I'm Anishinaabe from White Earth. Uh, my Ojibwe <coughs> name is Mishkawazizi B. Quay, which means Strong River Woman, oh. and I'm from the White Earth Nation of Ojibwe in northern Minnesota and I'm from the Crane Clan. Okay, thank you. Bridget? My name is Bridget Seiss Childs. My native name is Dibigizikikwe, which means Evening Moon Woman. Mm. Um, I'm from the White Earth Nation, and I'm Bear Clan. And Bear Clan. Lael, why don't you throw in what yours is? Sure. That you mentioned it before, but go yep. ahead, please. My Hiratsa name is Hishiwara Ogapagagish, and it means Peppermint Blossom, and I'm a member of the Knife Clan from the three affiliated tribes in North Dakota. Oh, isn't that just interesting? Thank you, ladies. I appreciate you um, being here, number one, and acquainting us with the indigenous culture, and specifically as it relates to your council and if you could tell us I guess because you're the spokeswoman mm -hmm. um, Eileen a little bit about the council how it began what what does the name mean and how long you've been together we've been meeting for six years and about three years ago we adopted the name Ogichidakwe Council and what really brought us to um, playing the drum and singing is that we had a 40-hour sexual assault training that took place a, a little over uh, a year and a half ago and at the conclusion of that training we had as a um, event drum making and our teacher Sharon Day said that she would come back and teach us how to sing so we've been singing for about a year and a half now and Sharon taught us for a couple of months and then Lael and Carly Fellner and Liz were, um, I don't know Liz's last name, but um, have been our teachers since then. So we have younger women teaching us now. And one of the reasons that we, um, I mean our primary reason for getting together is raising awareness and speaking out about sexual violence in our, in our native community two community members and two other grandmothers to the three generations. To the three generations. And could you tell me what Ogichi Dakwe means? I would defer to Emma. Okay, Emma. It means uh, warrior women. Warrior women. But it doesn't really mean that we're at war. It just means that we help each other and we help other, you know, people that need help and so that are traumatized. And 
with our singing, you know, we help them with our singing. Okay, so warrior isn't isn't from the traditional Western sense of what warrior means. It's more, as I remember, more of a spiritual warrior. Yes. That, okay, yeah. and if you can tell us as well, what, how this drumming works with victims of sexual assault? Well, it's uh, what we found out. I mean, it wasn't intentional that we expected it to. Um, be uh, a he we knew of it being a healing way, but that was on an intellectual level. Okay. And but we hadn't ourselves had experience in singing or having the drum, and it's still controversial with some tribes. It's, it was controversial maybe ten years ago with the Ojibwe people, and so it's a relatively um, it's relatively recent that we brought back using the drum for healing ways and so what what we're finding out is that for sexual assault victims in particular it heal it helps to heal from that trauma and I am you know a survivor of sexual assault I also an advocate uh, working with sexual assault survivors and also someone who Sundance for you know over two decades so I've uh, you know I've sought out ways to help with that I okay. was um, abducted and raped by a stalker in 1985 and you know went sought help in many different ways and was never able to effectively address that and once we started singing it really helped to um, it impacted my sleeping so that I can now sleep 90% of the time instead of the reverse. It's like I couldn't sleep 90% of a, out of a month I had trouble sleeping. So the so, singing and the drumming both have So the have singing and heal? the drumming have, have really helped incredibly. Wow. So I have, I have energy, I have a, a feeling of joy that, um, you know, that nothing else has been able to bring into my life. And it's just uh, a very wonderful, wonderful experience. And you know, there there is research to back that up, and maybe Lael would say something about that. Mm -hmm. Sure, we'd love to hear about any research about it, Lael. Yeah, um, from a Western perspective, there's some research out there about drumming across the world and how it helps with anxiety, trauma, stress, helps to reduce symptoms of that. The rhythm and the singing and dancing also can um, help with that. It can help minimize chronic pain, um, it can help to boost the immune system, um, it, it helps the whole body heal okay. instead of like like if you were to go to a talk therapist, you're just working in the prefrontal cortex, but with drumming and singing and what we believe is there's a spiritual aspect of that mm -hmm. too, that really helped to fully embody the healing in a spiritual way beyond just a western sure. treatment. Interesting. and. Bridget, what what do you get as a as a as a member of the of this council, as the, one of the singers and the drummers? What does it do for you personally as uh, an Indigenous woman? It gives me a lot of, of energy, but it also gave me my voice back. Say more about that. Well, prior to being um, learning how to sing and drum, I was always told that. I couldn't sing, that I couldn't carry a tune oh. in the basket. Now everybody says, I, I can sing. <laughs> <laughs> I can only sing in Indian, but I can okay. sing. <laughs> but also, it gave me a voice to speak out about the injustice of, you know, sexual violence and, and against Indian women. And we did a thing last Columbus Day, and I don't know why, but under that, that statue of Columbus, I wrote a banner that says, the first sexual predator of Indian women. Oh, <laughs> and, wow. And, wow. you know, prior to that, I would have never even thought of putting anything like that up there, but I have a voice now, and I Good can speak you. out against it and, and educate people. Uh, the newest research says that one out of every two Native women will have experienced sexual violence in their lifetime. Wow. And the U.S. Department of Justice has long used the statistics of one out of three Native women. So the newest, which is 
the newest research that's just come out within the past month. Okay. The same one out of two. One out of two. However, I I've worked with over 350 tribes um, who are addressing violence against Native women, and as I travel around the country to do that work, uh, what I'm hearing from the tribes is that 90 to 100 percent of their women have experienced sexual violence. And, and who's perpetrating the violence? Is this done primarily by Native men? Is it done by other ethnic groups? Can you address that? Well, when you look at statistics of who the perpetrator of sexual violence is, it's usually someone of the same ethnicity. Yes. And with Native women, it is not that way. Uh, the predominant um, perpetrator of sexual violence is white men. However, we are also being, um, I mean, we also experience sexual violence from other nationalities, including Native men. What we don't have currently is an accurate picture of that. So when you look at statistics, what that reflects is the Bureau of Justice statistics, and, and typically our tribes do not have input into that database. Oh. And that's just beginning to occur. It's relatively recent, I would say, within the past five or ten years that some of the, well, within the past five years that tribes are having input into that database. So we don't have an accurate picture of that, nor is there any research on the prevalence of sexual violence experienced by Native women. And I, I know mean men, I'm sorry. Native men, no, I know we had talked about that, and we're about running out of time, but it's my understanding that that the white men are able to get by with it, if you will, to a certain degree because they, they of the jurisdiction issue between um, they're, they're not protected uh, by civil rights, by civil law in the U.S., criminal law, but also by uh, the tribes, is that correct? Well, lawyers in the U.S. are not required uh, to have training around federal Indian law or tribal law. Okay. So there is confusion around jurisdiction between law enforcement. If you're an attorney, you have to be, um, uh, the tribes have to certify you to, um, to practice in tribal court. So it's a complex picture when you're talking about uh, tribal sovereignty, jurisdiction, and prosecution of non-natives in, in tribal court. And that's beginning to change, and it's beginning to change as a result of the Violence Against Women Act. Oh, I bet. Well, we could obviously sit and talk about this much more, and we've run out of time. So thank you. I appreciate the four of you You're being welcome. with me today. And we are going to be hearing some of their wonderful singing and drumming. So stay tuned. Thank you for joining us. So we're going to be singing a song for the women. It's Anishinaabe Kwe, and it's calling the women back to the circle, calling them back to the clan way of life, and calling them to dance real hard. Mm -hmm. 